And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. I'm a, a a man who a man who is a a man who is a aficionado of of the of fighting. I'm a, a man a man who is the who has the arguable face that lost a thousand shit posts, and the and the creator of the upcoming hero of the upcoming heroic action RPG Tidebreaker. The one and only Mr. Fall on My Blade himself, Nick Butler. Welcome back to the temple, man. How you doing? I'm all right, man. What's good? It's good. It's good. I'm just. I'm just waiting. F I'm just counting the days until winter comes back. Um. Since since I since I get all my free ammo when that happens. <laughs> oh, gross! I hate winter. Um. Uh, and uh, Christmas is like our. Uh... Consolation prize for all the snow. It's just loose. <laughs> well, you. Oh, where you are, you might have to. You might have to deal with um, snow and lightning sometimes. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, it's awful. Mm -hmm. uh, but so last time I had you on, we kind of ended up going all over the place, ranging from, ranging from be, ranging from being an, being a being an East Coast nerd to. To a lot, to a lot of a lot of fighting game stuff, to um, to dip to um, dipping into aspects of Tidebreaker, but we didn't um, we didn't we didn't get as focused as we as we probably should have, and some of that is my fault because I because I run an open bar and a and a very casual approach to the whole thing. But for this one, I would for this one I would like to go a little a little bit more in depth. Um, I know, I know that the, that, um, that it's, that it's still, it's still in the early access phase. Um, but I think, but I think that, I think there's enough of a foundation to go, to go over it without, cut without covering something that's going to get, um, er that's going to get eroded out in six months. Yeah, it's mostly, uh, it's mostly about what you're going to get when it hits crimp. Like, um, I'm pretty much just at the point where, like, like, everything that's left to do is just writing examples and balancing things. Mm -hmm. But, um, the core experience is going to be mostly unchanged. Yeah, so, we'll, we'll start with, we'll start with the, with the bones, with the dice. Um, now you're, you, now you're using a success-based, a success-based D6 pool. Um, yep. And with and with that in, and um with and the magic number for that much like in Shadowrun is fo is 4 or higher. Mhm. Mm um we'll start with we'll start with what prompted what prompted that particular system. Was it a was a artifact of games you had played previously or w was there a different reason you went with D6s? Um D6s are just kind of easier to get a hold of. Mm -hmm. And uh, like just having like four or five sets, it's just kind of like a coin flip. But there's more I could do with it because it's, you know, it's a fifty percent chance. But there's three different numbers that you can um make other like uh like options pop out of right. Like um with the explosions happening on sets by default and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But like reasons and math and things but it's yeah. mostly because these sets are very common so you can get lots of them um for fairly cheap so i didn't want to like put a barrier for entry mm -hmm. for people i'm um, looking to try the game out yeah now when now when it comes to when it comes now one of the one of the key one of the key what makes you di what makes you different um setups is going to be quirks and um and in and in particular the standout only. Um, now, as I understand, as I understand it, quirks 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 aren't going to are going to be akin to say feats or um, knacks or or talents in that regard. Something that skews your character a, cer a certain way, but not something defining. Mm. Oh, if we're gonna use like Dungeons and Dragons um, analogs, they're I, I would say they're kind of closer to like traits. 
but like really strong ones. They're mm-hmm. kind of like traits meets feats, mm-hmm. as far as like power level goes. Like they're definitely not character defining, but they do set like a precedent for like how your character is going to play at the table. Mm-hmm. Like you're going to play differently than the next person that's to you based on the three quirks that you pick. And your standout feature is going to make you very much different because it's it's unique. Now, uh, I know I know that you I know that you put in a side about about um cr- about creating about creating new new cor- new quirks and um standouts. Um, yeah. What would you say is the dividing line if someone was to create if someone was to create one or the other about what would be what would lean more towards a quirk and what would lean more towards a standout? Um, there's not like a hard and fast rule for, for the dividing line, but it's more of just like a, you gotta like hit a certain feeling. Like if, if you're getting like more than like a plus one or, or something, then you're probably leaning towards like standout feature territory. Cause it's just a matter of strength and, um, standouts tend to have more active requirements where like they almost like can serve as a, as a fourth ability, right? Some of them are passive. Some of them have active um, um, features in the uh, in the writing, but like quirks tend to just always be passive, with like very rare exceptions, and they tend to do something smaller. Mm-hmm. Where standouts do something like huge that like tends to like um, work with the hope and doom mechanics, which is our our meta resource pool for like changing big things in the narrative and doing a lot of like wonky stuff with your dice. Um, but yeah, that's the biggest difference is just the amount of stuff that you can do with a quirk versus a standout feature. All right. And of, of course, some, um, of course, just, just from, just from my own perspective, I, I can't help but notice that there's a lot, there's a significant more um, text when it comes to, when it comes to standouts. Yeah. Um, and with and with that and with that that also brings me to one of the what's ar- what's arguably going to be the what's arguably going to be the crunchiest um, part part of part of the setup in the form of ability creation. Mm-hmm. Um, not not to say not to say that it's going to be difficult, but just there's it's the one with the most potential options. Yeah, and. With the now, the a lot of a lot of tidebreakers seem seems to be seems to be built around um, fast action. Um, mm-hmm. When it came to when it came to a bit when it came to ability when it came to the creation of abilities, um, how how do you how do you make sh- how do you make sure that's maintained without it go- without it um, without ability creation getting overwhelming? Um, that has been the most challenging part of cre- uh, making the game so far is because there's like a lot of options. Um, newer players will uh, might have the tendency of going, "Oh crap! Like, what do I even do with that?" Um, my advice, yeah, I'm not sure if I even wrote it in there, but I should definitely write it in there. That um, just pick what looks cool mm-hmm. for the most part. Um, everything is balanced in a way that um, if you pick two things that look that feel like they might work together, it's going to work. Um, because we don't do too much with, on the, on the side of like uh, making your numbers a lot better. Like a lot of the um, functions in Tidebreaker lean more towards doing things with like how your character moves around the board and um, like defending yourself against certain options and doing like status ailments and things versus like just raw damage options. Um, so like you're going to be doing more for changing the um, the landscape of the battlefield versus just, like, taking, like, two functions to just outright obliterate a target. Mm-hmm. Um, so characters tend to be more or less, like, the um, on the same playing field as far as, like, how much damage they can deal directly to their, to their opponents. And anything that gives you, like, a lot more damage usually requires, like, a little bit more of a setup. Where like uh, you have to like charge over a couple of turns, or you like deal damage to somebody that's been hit with a status ailment first, and then you deal out your attrition, etc. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you find out those things more as you play the game. So like 
the the game is geared towards like uh discovery of like all the cool stuff that you can do Mm -hmm. um not so much about just like sitting there and tinkering with it until you get like the perfect um numerical advantage over someone because there's not a lot of that to be found yeah Mm -hmm. um i will admit when i went when i went through the when i went through the um the ability lists What I was honestly reminded of is the SFX rules in Cortex. Just, mm. in, just in terms, just in, not in term, not in. It's not an exact comparison, but in terms of their, in terms of their overall, in terms of their overall theming, where it's where it's more where it's more built to rep to represent a certain, a certain the- a certain theme or a certain approach. Um. Yeah. That sounds right. I haven't read Quartets, but like I, I like the vibe of that. Oh, I should I should specify that I'm referring to the um Cortex Plus, which was which was utilized in Marvel Heroic Role Playing and um Firefly. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, that sounds more familiar. Yeah, because I was thinking of like the current Cortex, which I haven't read yet. Um, current Cortex isn't Cortex Prime isn't too far removed, but um. Uh, but I'm ho- but it's got, but it's got its own little um, monkey wrenches thrown in thrown into the mix. I I'm hold I'm holding off on co- on covering Cortex Prime in depth until Tales of Zadia comes out, which is there mm. which is there which is going to be a um, Cortex Prime adaptation of the Dragon Prince. Ooh, that's going to be cool. And well, as an aside, you have no idea how thankful I am that they didn't that they ended up picking Cortex and not D and D. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> Um, I've I've heard ta- I've heard talk that a he- that a um that a Cortex Prime adaptation of He Man is also on the way. Um, haven't heard haven't heard anything concrete about that yet. But that that's a- interesting. It can certainly work. Um, I'd say it would work a hell of a lot more than using D twenty. Speaking as somebody mm-hmm. who's used D twenty for it once. Yeah, I, I feel like he man is a little bit outside of the typical D and D power scale, for like um, how swords and things work or whatever. Yeah, which bring which brings me to which brings me to one other thing. In testing, um, have has has anyone com- has anyone compared Tidebreaker to um, superhero games? You know, stuff yeah. stuff like stuff like Champions or Mutants and Masterminds. Or, or um, bash. Yep. <laughs> um, definitely have gotten comparisons to the hero system at least. Um, but like we tend to get compared more towards just like TV shows and anime versus like actual like um, other like game systems. Uh, we've gotten comparisons to Lancer a lot too. I honestly I don't see it. Yeah, like I don't know either, but um, but uh, we have playtesters that are like really big into Lancer, and it's just kind of like the the whole customization thing, um, being like very like strongly front and center, where um Lancer kind of has that same vibe too, from my understanding. I haven't um read Lancer yet, but this is just the uh, um what I've been told. I have and um. Lance Lancer's Lancer's customization isn't ex- it's cer- it's certainly there but it but it's um but it's not but it but it's not as it's not as freeform as what you're as what you're doing. Um, yeah. Plus and when it comes to mechanics well um La- Lancer it Lancer is a is a um is a fusion dance between between aspects of D and D fourth edition and Shadow of the Demon Lord, so that's why I f- that's why I find it a bit perplexing. Um, mm-hmm. Same with the hero system comparison, because well, for one, you're not nearly as cr- you're not nearly as crunchy in character creation as hero system is, and two, while you both use D sixes, um, it's doing it's doing three D six in some total, not not. <laughs> Not um a die pool like you're doing. Yeah. So, so I was just trying to like take those older systems and just remove most of the math, to be honest. <laughs> mm-hmm. so, I like tinkering with things and just pairing up bunches of options together. I yeah. don't like doing math. 
Yeah. But when it com when it comes to when it comes when it comes to creating um when it comes to creating a bit when it comes to creating abilities and f and functions um I'm get I'm guessing I'm guessing that there's that you have a bit of you have a bit of an aside go going into what going into um how it's how it'd be good to have a variety and not and not dump all of them into one meta type yeah um like the only real advantage of like making three abilities that are like very similar is when you're facing opponents that are like that want to like lock down one of your ability options so mm -hmm. like if you're like hey i really like doing this ability a which happens to be like overwhelming and massive or something just to do like lots of damage to lots of people and then your ability B and C are pretty much the same thing. And your opponent's like, hey, could you stop doing that? And you could just be like, no, you're going to have to disable the other two, or else I'm going to keep AoEing everybody. Um, but, like, which would be effective in its own right? I, I just personally think that would be, like, a boring way to build. But, um... Because, like, you'd literally be a one-note character. But, um... You'd also be a one-note character that is very hard to stop from doing their one-note. <laughs> Um, and some something else, some, and within within that within that, I'm guess I'm guessing I'm guessing that one of the one of your other goals was to make sure that that um when it came to resource use with abilities, um, that you that you you don't have as often people playing defensive. Um, I think. It's not so much that I don't want people to play defense. It's just that I don't want defense or offense to, um, to be like the whole end all be all option. So, like, for people that are playing it at a more like in depth level where they want to like, like, use it to like be really strategic instead of just going, like, hey, I have a cool ability, this skin with like, like this dude from One Piece or whatever, whatever fantasy that they're trying to play, right? Um, but some people are going to want to really play it for like for more of a tactical game. I wanted to give them options to like really like um, go in depth with that method of expression. You know what I'm saying? So like they could say, "Hey, like I have this ability that locks down like two other things and allows me to move back and create walls and stuff." And your opponents can be like, "Yeah, and I break walls and uh, do blah blah blah." Um, to have like a lot of cool interactions with each other. Um, so it's not so much like offense being better than defense or defense being better than offense. It ends up being more of a, uh, did you come up with a really good build and are you playing that build well? Yep. Right. So it's almost like a kind of like a competitive aspect mm -hmm. um, to it, which is there if you want to engage with the game that way. But um, I just kind of left room for it. Mm -hmm. Now, when it now, when it so I'd given given that um, when it comes to when it comes to tri when it comes to tricks, uh, mm -hmm. where where do, where does where does that factor and where and where do they dip and where do, and where would they differ from um, functions? Um, they don't differ from functions because tricks are functions. Mm -hmm. um, the trick system is there so you can come up with solutions on the fly mm -hmm. um because i always felt like tabletop rpg games tend to like really not let you do stuff outside of your character sheet where characters in fiction tend to just pull out like shit from their ass every once in a while right mm -hmm. because like you know they're people they can improvise they can take advantage of their situations and their trainings and sometimes you forget stuff and sometimes you happen to have like an extra grenade in your pocket that you haven't used up until this point right mm -hmm. um and heroes adapt they learn things like quickly and the trick system is there to um to kind of uh emulate that right mm -hmm. uh so you can say hey like my uh my like fireball is usually just made out of range and element right an element fire because it's literal fireball Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, what if I, like, shot two ever fireballs inside of it to make them split up and explode, and now, like, my fireball has, like, has massive attached to it now, so I can, like, make the fireball explode. Mm -hmm. uh, because, like, you just came up with this cool idea on the fly. I don't want 
anybody to just be like, no, you can't do that. Yeah. So, like, if a player is being creative or if they just happen to plan those little awesome moments in their head in between games, um, they can pull that out, you know? And, um, and like, have that little moment where they're impressing everybody at the table because they've been sitting there, like, lovingly crafting their build, like, days ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Um, the trick system is there to do that. Yeah. Now... With the, with that kind with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, um, I will note that when I that when I mentioned defense, it, that was I was I wasn't I wasn't implying say tank builds or something like that, but more of more of people having the rainy day trap, um, mm-hmm. or or to put it another way, maybe I I shouldn't u- I shouldn't use one of my ninety nine mega elixirs. What if I need it for later? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean. Um... It's a little bit different than having, um, like, a JRPG inventory system. Mm -hmm. Because the tricks, you come up with them when you feel like it. Mm -hmm. And, like, when you're done using it, you can do it again. Right? The next time, it costs momentum. Um, I'm not sure if that's in the EA version, but in the current version of the game that we're writing now, um, when you use a trick the first time, it's free. The second time, it requires momentum to trigger it again. Or you could just do another trick. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, for, with a different function. And just keep doing that. But, um... By the default progression rules, doing tricks is how you, um... Is how you get keys to unlock, like, the upgrades and stuff for your character to, to um, begin with. Mm-hmm. And one of the most common upgrades is install, which lets you put one of those tricks onto one of your abilities permanently. Mm-hmm. So, like, you can just be like, hey, my sword spews out... Mega elixirs. Uh, because fuck you, I heal when I swing now. <laughs> Doesn't have to make sense. It's cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like, God damn it, I earned it. <laughs> By doing ethers and like freaking, um, geez, I can't remember other Final Fantasy consumables other than pot, ether, and mega elixir. Or softs and stuff like that, right? Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, but like that Final Fantasy character being played in Tidebreaker has been improvising stuff from their inventory to get out of various situations until they've got to the point where they're like, hey, I've been doing this enough where like it's pretty easy for me to do this now. Mm-hmm. And now this is part of my standard arsenal. Right. Um, and that's how the tricks and the upgrades work mm-hmm. is that eventually you're not improvising anymore. This is just something you do. And something I did notice when it came to the way, when it came to the way upgrades are are set up is there's there's mo- there are while it while it's not while it's not exactly full full free form a la world of dark a la world of darkness and similar games um, there are multiple angles to go around when it comes to advancing your uh, character. Mm-hmm. Um, was. In an early draft, was was it a bit more of that freeform XP as XP as currency to direct to directly upgrade kind of approach? Nah, we never really did that. It was very much like, yeah, due to improvise improvisation stuff, you get rewarded for it because like the whole goal was just to like get players to be comfortable with just doing stunts and using their functions and exploring the system and uh when you put when you tie the uh your progression to that that's one big way to reward it everything in tidebreaker's design is made to reward people exploring the game and entertaining their table Mm mm-hmm um, so for tricks, for stunts, through progression, the showstopper mechanic, um, which is just like stunts, but even better um, for anyone that heard the last interview or any other interview I've done, mm-hmm. uh, I mentioned it. But it's all tied together for for one of two goals: is to be entertaining and to learn the game, mm-hmm. right? So you can then be more entertaining. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Because like the game is just about having fun. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the one of the one of the defining features within within Tidebreaker is the relationship between hope and doom, which 
We did um we did t we did touch it we did touch on the on these two meta currencies um last time but I'd like to go I'd like to go a little bit further in into how the how the players use hope how the GM uses doom and how they um interplay with each other. Sounds good to me. Uh, let me pull up the section just so I can uh, be a little bit more refreshed on it. Mm -hmm. Like it hasn't changed much since the beginning. Other than like adding like new options and such, but mm -hmm. um, it's always good to be able to like have stuff at a glance. Okay, I'm good. All right. So when it, <clears throat> we'll start with um, we'll start with hope. Yeah. So. So you want me talking about it? Or you got a question? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, w I want I want you to go over the skin uh, the skinny of of. Of how of how hope is is used and generated by the players. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, the way hope works is it's basically your resource that is the um, embodiment of like all of the good stuff in the world, positive, mad, uh, minded, badassery everywhere and stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. This is your luck. This is your willpower. This is everything that makes that hero heroic outside of like their quirks and their powers and what source whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and through the use of hope, you can do a couple of things. Um, you can alter how the dice work. You can gain other character-specific um, resources like momentum. You can establish facts in the world um, via the spout exposition, and a um, couple of other things that are like very like combat-specific uh, um, options. And there are some things like expanding an area to create resources in your community. Uh, so, like, hey, your castle needs a wall. Well, I spent some hope, and there are people building it. Um, if you have the hope, things things happen. You can make you can make things happen. Um, this is what separates a tiebreaker like PC from like any other NPC in the world that's not one of the villains. Is that through their strength of willpower, they get shit done. Mm -hmm. um, and hope is kind of how we do that. To get hope back, there's a couple of ways to um, to get hope back. Um, some quirks and standouts will have like specific things that will, will trigger um, you regaining hope. Um, triggering the excellence mechanic um, from chapter one mm -hmm. is just uh, every so often you can like do something that really drops the GM's draw mm -hmm. and helps push the story forward, and they will give you one instance of excellence that you can trigger at any point. And excellence allows you to like basically defy death and just get up when you should have been thrown off a cliff like Disney villain style and just pop back into that scene. Mm -hmm. But it's also doing so by being like an emergency supply of hope, which will just allow you to start using it to like recover through things. Um, solving problems in your neighborhoods gives you hope. Like, is there an old lady that, like, her fruit stand's broken? If you repair it, it, re it restores hope because you did something good for the world. Mm -hmm. uh, your characters all have subplots for, like, because they've got things that they do. Like, tiebreakers are motivated people. Mm -hmm. um, anytime you resolve a, sub a subplot, restores your um, restores some hope. Um, there are places called beacons of hope in the world. The beacons of hope can take any shape or form. It can Liberty is a beacon of hope. Like a particular piece of art somewhere is a beacon of hope. Mm -hmm. uh, a very cute puppy could be a beacon of hope. So, like, we have mechanics for petting dogs. <laughs> um, in fact, that's actually the example in the book um, is pet, go pet a dog, get some hope back. Um, and the last thing to get help, hope back is to just screw yourself over. Um, if you do something to intentionally complicate yourself, mm -hmm. it will restore one hope in exchange for an obstacle being placed on one of your um, subplots to make your to make it harder for you to get that done later. Um, but doing that, like, allows you to get some hope back. All right. And co consequent, consequently, um, on the other side of the coin, we have Doom. Yeah. Doom is the dark, edgy version of hope. This is for the bad guys. Mm -hmm. um, it does everything hope does, and does some extra stuff like allowing the allowing your bad guy character to just go. No, I'm not going to die. I'm going to just uh, kick somebody 
out of the room and then run away because, you know, I'm a big hammy bad guy. I'm Dr. Doom, like quite literally. <laughs> Um, like you can no sell damage. You can um, literally knock a PC on their ass and start gloating to um, to like gain momentum. What momentum is the resource in combat that allows you to like supercharge your abilities and things. But like, and if you um, end up revealing one of your secrets, you can actually do that without paying the doom costs because bad guys just love to talk about themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, but one of the uh, most prominent options for um for using doom is called a harbinger and a harbinger is a special mark that indicates that something bad's going to happen um in the target location or to a particular target um and you can place a harbinger without saying what it is and later you can pop the harbinger later to um do whatever effect that you want um to that target but there's a very specific thing about Harbingers that can be particularly scary. If you place a Harbinger on a target that already has one, that target becomes destroyed, and the only thing immune to that are players themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, you can put Harbingers on things and then have the PCs do what they can to protect that thing before the next one gets popped on it. Um, but, yeah, like, it's basically your dun-dun-dun button. Um, yeah. you do that just to fucking scare players to death mm-hmm. um, but yeah there's more options but we've only got so much time to talk and yeah. also I want people to buy the books and read it. <laughs> I'm not I'm not gonna do I'm not gonna do the buy my book um, drop from drop from the critic that's too easy um, <laughs> but with now when now with that with that kind of thing in mind um I'm get I'm get I'm guessing that, I'm guessing that in bo- in bo- in cases of both hope and doom, um, one of your goals was to have it be a re- have it be a resource that can be, some somewhat relied upon, but um, but ho- but hoard but hoarding it is uh, is not advisable. Yeah, um, like you want to use it when you're going to get the most bang for your buck out of it, particularly for hope. Mm-hmm. Um, for Doom, the GM has twice the starting Doom that the players do, and they get one point back whenever hope is spent. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the GM can be a lot more liberal with how um, how they spend it, but the players can kind of play around that by like just keeping, by actually hoarding on to their hope for a little bit mm-hmm. until the GM starts like wasting their Doom, like saving bad guys and whatever, and just just being a dick with harbingers and stuff. Because eventually, like. Like the good will win out mm-hmm. in the end, right? Yeah. Um, and then the bad guys won't have anything else to like fall back on. Mm-hmm. Like Doctor Doom is eventually going to run out of Doom box, and then you're going to punch him physically in his face, mm-hmm. and he can't do anything cheeky about it. Like he's just going to catch those hands. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the game just kind of plays out that way. Um, mm-hmm. when you're using the, the hope and Doom mechanics, the way that they're intended. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the, uh, one of the there's a there's one of the bit one of the bigger um one of the one of the bigger effects that c- that can happen when it comes when it comes to that sort of high drama approach is um sh- is showstoppers. Yep. Um. Now, when it com- now when it comes to that, what's what would you say is the narrative goal for so- for something like Showstoppers, and then and after that we can go into how it would a- how it would actually work. Showstoppers are just there to reward the players. Like if you're being particularly entertaining, enjoy your extra dice. There's really like nothing more to it other than just saying, "Hey, go you! Whatever you're doing, keep doing that," mm-hmm. and here's some dice. Here's a lot of dice. <laughs> like, here's dice that make more dice via the explosions. Um, you know, because, like like I said, the primary motivation is for players to have fun entertaining each other with, like, cool, ridiculous stories, right? Where, like, they're going over the top, like, all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of the showstopper mechanic is is kind of like it balances itself out because like once you set that standard for like like how like absolutely like over the top your your game gets it kind of normalizes 
Mm-hmm. So like, um, because the way the showstoppers work is that you're voting to see like if it passes to become one or not, because like you do a stunt, which is just a cool description of what you're doing. Like you get one die. Woohoo. Right. But if uh, people are like, Hey, that's a showstopper. That's ridiculous. Then you go through the mechanic and you start getting your rerolls and your explosions and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. But not every stunt is going to become a showstopper, yeah. you know? But your table will naturally come to like its own sort of um, groove and pacing for like windows happen. Mm-hmm. Now, one of, one other thing that I think I think is somewhat I think is somewhat important when discussing um, the way conflicts are going to work is you are not you are not doing a traditional um, health setup, not not in the form of HP or even or even. Some, even something like a wound system, like I mentioned, the aforementioned World of Darkness. Instead, yeah. instead you have said you have a set of um, phases up, down, and out. Yep. Um, was that was that merely to streamline managing health? Um, yes, but it's also there because um, I want it to have very pulpy characters that are just like gritting their teeth and just like getting knocked down getting knocked through a building or something and just like kind of like crawling through the rubble and just like channeling their like inner heroism and their mm-hmm. oafs to their friends and stuff and all that dramatic shit right mm-hmm. um and it was harder to emulate that within a wound system because wound systems tend to end up being like death spirals for the most part like every time i've seen a wound system you just start to suck after a while mm-hmm um and hit point systems you're just fantastic until you hit zero <laughs> i.e the black knight meme <laughs> yeah that's like it's just a scratch <laughs> scratch your arms off <laughs> yeah i can still fight <laughs> um yeah but like when you're like you you take damage in tiebreaker it means something mm-hmm. like every single round right but like you can still get up and and perform at like full power once you make the roll to do so mm-hmm. like so like you're going to be bouncing back and forth and the way that we kind of like rein that in so you're just not like um ping-ponging all over the place is um our damage system what's called attrition mm-hmm. uh because once you start taking that damage you keep bouncing out from out to up back and forth right mm-hmm. Um, that attrition is going to build up and it's going to keep making you have those gritting my teeth moments a little harder to, um, to make happen. Um, cause like at first you're going to like, okay, wow, that really fucking hurt. He crit me. <laughs> right. But I can get back up cause I'm still mostly fresh. Yeah. But like you keep getting hit you and those hits become crits more often. Eventually you're going to go out and then you're going to take another hit and you're dead. Mm-hmm. Um, because you're not making that roll to get back up. And so, like, you're kind of, like, just trying to pull your hand back up, and you're, like, you're shaking, and then you're just, like, you know, and you just, you just fall down. Mm-hmm. And then it's up to your opponent if they're going to finish you off or not, right? Um, but, like, eventually, you're going to give in. Yeah. But, like, it makes really great drama, like, um, in practice, because, like, you don't know if they're going to make that role or not, or if somebody's going to, like kick the bad guy away long enough for you to like take a breather which is one of our actual mechanics where like if you're not being bothered you can get up one more time Mm -hmm. um regardless of the rules um so like you know we have built-in power of friendship (laughs) where like your your teammates can help keep you going just a little bit longer even like if you had no business surviving that that last attack Mm -hmm. um but yeah that's our health system it's it's built for drama yeah and I'd, um, I'm surprised. I'm surprised you haven't. I'm surprised you haven't put up an image of push to add drama any anywhere on your Twitter at any point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. Like, like I'm only one guy doing all the marketing, so like, <laughs> I can't think of everything. <laughs> well, uh, well, and to be to be fair, I'm only one. I'm only one guy running the temple, so I get. So we're both in the same boat. Um, yeah, but. With it, but even even with even with that, um, would it be? F- I think I think you still. I think if I'm re- if I've assessed this right, there are still op- there are still options 
to be to be u to be um, utilized. So it's so it's not just a case of once once you go, I go, and th and then ba and then back and forth. There are still ways to um, throw monkey wrenches into that. Yep. Oh. Uh, like I said, there's the uh, the take a breather option for like when somebody like kick somebody off of you you can get back up and that's just one way to ignore the attrition for a little while mm. but we have a system called interrupts um in the game like the basic interrupt just costs like five momentum to do and then you can uh mm. like throw like some sand in somebody's eye or something to get them off of you mm. and uh, it will happen before your opponent's turn happens and if your opponent is still able to attack the attack happens it doesn't just cancel them it just lets you spend some of your um resources to do an emergency action mm -hmm. uh, there are functions in the game which also do some extra stuff when you trigger interrupts mm -hmm. like uh like juke lets you not only do your interrupt but move one zone away so like if your opponent happens to be a melee guy and you have the momentum to get the fuck out of the way do so mm -hmm. like run <laughs> right um so like that's that's our big our big thing for um getting like some monkey wrenches into the initiative order. And the other thing is initiative shifts. And initiative shifts, um, once initiative's rolled, like it's not like your number count, mm -hmm. it's just the turn order. And um so like if you're first, I'm second, and the bad guy's last, and then like I can pump myself up one to make you go second mm -hmm. and or the bad guy it's i probably should do this with like two or three other people so like say me you bad guy one bad guy two, bad guy three mm -hmm. but like, bad guy one is the most dangerous so like say like afterwards you go huh maybe i should knock him down to the bottom and then and then make nick go before the next guy goes and then you can make me go yeah but you can do a lot to change the turn order mm -hmm. uh to like make effects happen when they would be most beneficial to the team. It's inter it's interesting that you bring that kind of thing up since um, the other day when I was do when I was doing the um, Valley of the Judge series, I had I had made I had offhandedly mentioned that initiative doesn't in, initiative turn order doesn't matter as much after the first round. Mm -hmm. And I feel like stuff like this would be can be a way to make it still matter because you can still get not. You can still get knocked or knocked around in the initiative order. Yeah. And, and so uh, the other thing we have with uh, that's connected to initiative shifts are the um, cornered and um, overextended um, status effects. Mm -hmm. so, like, if you happen to like be fighting a speedster or something, you can take advantage of their like overconfidence by like initiative shifting them up so that. They're first, and then they become overextended. Mm -hmm. And what, what happens with that is that it removes one of their defensive options. And same thing with cornered. If somebody's slow, 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 and then you just drop them down to, like, beyond last, they become cornered, and they lose mm -hmm. lose a defense option. Um, I believe it's I believe it's dodging for overextended and blocking for, for cornered. Um, yeah. That that brought that um, brought that prompted something else because when it um, even though even though they're using different stats, um, I was cu I was curious if there if there are um, if there are significant dis differences between choosing the block and choosing the dodge. Um, if you take the functions out of the um, equation, no, they're both just I'm using my better stat to not take damage. Mm -hmm. Um. What differentiates them is how certain functions interact with certain stats. Where uh, we have two particular effects called on contact and on dodge. Mm -hmm. Where on contact stuff, if your opponent chooses the block, the on contact effect happens regardless of the die result. Mm -hmm. when this, and the same thing with on dodge. If they choose to dodge, then the effect happens. Um, so you get this, uh, this little mitts up situation where you're like, oh, hey, like, I'm really good at blocking, but my opponent has, like, almost exclusively on contact effects. Mm -hmm. So if I keep blocking, 
even though I'm not taking direct damage, he's going to keep making bad things happen to me mm-hmm. until I decide to dodge. All right. right? Now, uh, oh, go, go ahead. Yeah, and then there is the um, the other thing that we have is called a momentum shift, which mm-hmm. is a default thing that anybody can do regardless of their character build. Um, if you spend enough for momentum where it equals your opponent's um, intuition, you can decide if your opponent blocks or dodges and what stat you use the roll when you're attacking them. So um, characters that have like really high defenses that just kind of turtle behind that one stat um, will end up eventually getting hit. So like combat always moves forward one way or another. Mm -hmm. Like there's not going to be like very long standstills. Like you can't just like turtle somebody to death unless you're doing something on your turn too, other than just like, continuing to boost your defense Mm -hmm. so the game is somewhat offense oriented but it's because defense is very good um without much investment yeah now what would in the in the time in the time in the time that you've been developing this um what would you say have been some of the big takeaways from say play testing and um and and the kickstarter campaign um, from playtesting, simple is better. It is <laughs> is um, the big thing that I've gotten from... Because uh, the mechanics used to be a lot more convoluted. Like, uh, there's a lot of options in the game now, but you don't need all of them, and you can introduce them at the rate that you want to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so a lot of the feedback I've gotten from playtesting was basically, oh, wow, Like at first, this game is it's got a lot of depth. There's a lot of options. But you can basically enjoy this game with just the stuff in chapter one, mm-hmm. right? And then add on quirks and abilities and functions and momentum shifts and blah, 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 right? Mm-hmm. Um, but, like, just having that level of um, emerging complexity was, like, kind of a, was kind of, like, a important design goal but like when I started, it was just complexity, complexity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like it was just like a lot of shit going on. But now, like everything's more kind of like centralized, and then there's other options that you can kind of like tag on there at your um, at your leisure. Um, as far as the Kickstarter was concerned, it was very much like I need to hire somebody to do Kickstarter stuff for me in the future. Kickstarter's hard. <laughs> yeah, it it can be. Um, there, was a, there was a lot of management um, stuff that you have to go around. Like, I wish I could have like came up with some ways to automate things, particularly like sending out PDFs. Mm-hmm. Like, I spent pretty much the whole month just like emailing people PDFs and things, like, uh, and just kind of like going, "Oh God, I just sent that guy the PDF, and then he canceled his pledge." Now that he got the game free. Uh, things because we had this game for free like last year like before november like mm -hmm. like because the early access version like there wasn't much of a change from january to november you know i just decided to start charging it on november because lo and hope behold we ended up getting like fucking 500 people or so like looking at the game that weren't looking at it before because i decided to put a price tag on it Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, value your work. Um, like, I, I would like to tell devs that any, like, expiring devs, like, don't undersell yourself. Because if you do, no one's going to think that your work is worth it. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, it doesn't even matter how good your work is. Like, my game is very good. Like, um, and I say that because people tell me my game is very good. Like, I'm not a particularly confident guy. Um, but most of my feedback is very good feedback. You know, people say, Hey, like this is the kind of game I've been looking for. Right. Um, and some people are like, Hey, like this is definitely not the game I'm looking for because I'm a grognard and I don't like cinematic stuff, mm-hmm. which is cool. Be a grognard. That's fine. Like uh D and D is still out there for you. Enjoy, you know, no hard feelings. Um, but, but like, valuing yourself and your work will take you a very long way 
And I think a big part of the success of our Kickstarter was just uh, me and the team going, look, we're badasses. Look at our game. Our game is badass. And my artists are like, hey, we're really good at what we do. Mm -hmm. Check out our art. Check out the stuff we did for this guy. It's amazing. Yeah. And that energy is contagious. Mm -hmm. You know? And um, I think a lot of people were like, hey, man, like, shit, I think they're right. And it was enough where we seceded in Densum. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and we can, and with that with that in mind, um, like what I know I mentioned this last last time, but I and I, but obviously things can be in flux. What are you shooting for as far as a release window for the PDF version? Um, shit. I want to get the whole thing out by July. Um, I I feel like. Once we get all of the art done, then it's just a matter of getting it through editing. Because by the time all the art's done, all of the stretch goal writing should be done like a month or two before that, mm-hmm. if if not even like sooner. Um, because artists all tend to work at different speeds. Like I have one artist that she puts out shit like two or three days after I um pay her. Like she's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um. And, you know, some of my other guys take, like, a full month for, like, one picture. Um, so it really depends on, like, how much I buy from particular artists on the team. Um, and the rest of it is just me getting off my ass and finish, finishing these balancing updates. But beyond that, like, editing is not going to take that long. Mm-hmm. Um, and Francita's already got most of her graphic layout stuff. It's just already, like, set ahead. She's just like, look, dude, just give me the test so I can stick the shit in there. <laughs> um, so, like, it's really going to come down to just, like, me finishing the balancing stuff and getting the art done. But um, that should be a few months. But everything should be done by July, and by by everything done, I mean also like printing and stuff being like starting to get shipped out to people's houses. So I, I don't want to really like put out a separate date for the PDF, um, just to be safe. But I would like to have everything done by March, and then um, July would be the very latest because that's what we said on the Kickstarter itself. Mm-hmm. Um. And I, and I will certainly be looking forward to to seeing how it de- how it develops, as I mentioned before, um, especially especially since um, I am I am in fu- I am in full belief that the t- that the tabletop scene one needs more heroic shit and two needs more weeb shit. <laughs> no, don't stick us with the weebs. <laughs> yeah, I mean like. I have mixed feelings about weebs in general. Like I like anime. I just just like, like um, anime on Twitter is just kind of a shithole. I I I'm not. I don't even pay attention to that. Um, I'm I mainly say I mainly say that because I like I like giving certain traditionalists a lot a lot of sh- a lot of shit. Um, o- over over the idea about what inspirations I'm supposed to take in my fantasy games. Yeah, yeah. Like I I hate like. Graybeards, dude. Oh, uh, like they're kind of the worst because they're just like, dude. What do you mean this isn't like, like, seventeenth century Europe where everyone has arming swords and can't jump more than two feet? Like, uh, well, the I think I told you this before, but the story I always come back to is the shitstorm that came about with Tome of Battle, um, in the two thousands. Oh my god, yeah, and uh, and. Uh, Toll of Battle was great, although um, Path of Path of War, which mm-hmm. it, which it which is basically the Pathfinder version of Toma Battle, is much better. Oh, it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, I am not a huge fan of the D twenty system, but the guys that did Path of War, brilliant. Like they did a great job of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I but I remember th- I remember people get I remember some people getting mad about two things. One. That it was turn it was turning fighters it was turning fighters and other martial characters into wizards, um, mm-hmm. and two that the that the that it was it was somehow it was somehow wrong to draw in, to draw inspiration from 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 video games and from manga because at the time at the time 
I think I think I think their insp I think the inspirations they mentioned were Devil May Cry, Soul, Soul Calibur, I think Sweet I think Sweet Could End, and um, I think and the and some of the bigger Shonen entries at the time like Bleach and Naruto, um, and uh, like Soul Calibur is not even that fancy. No, like most that are more just regular degular natural arts with like some lightning effects on them. Mm -hmm. Um. But but just just the fa just the fact that it what that you weren't drawing notes from to from Tolkien or Vance or or Lieber is uh, is apparent apparently apparently like, not apparently not fantasy enough and um there was fantasy a being the genre that can pull from fucking anything but you only want to pull from like three white dudes like um, just like I, I like the most boring of them too like my dude my like, um. Okay. Send me the hate mail. Tolkien sucks. I said, like, <laughs> um, <laughs> I um, I d I don't hate. I don't. I don't hate Tolkien. What I re what I resent is what I what I re resent is the idea that 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 that's the default I should f that I should follow. Um, yeah, I'm. That's more where I'm at too. Like, I actually liked Lord of the Rings when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. It's just that I more hate his influence than his work itself. It's it's for the same reason that I um I rem I remember ha I remember getting a bit of resentment for s for s for the idea that a a uh, Castlevania game has to use the Metroidvania formula um because I rem I remember when Lords of Shadow came out and people complained that it wasn't doing the Metroidvania format when Mercury Steam made explicitly clear they had no interest in doing that format their inspiration was um the was the NES and SNES era. Yeah, which is fine, I think. Mm -hmm. In fact, in fact, I'd say when they tried when they tried to compromise and util and utilize those Metroidvania aspects, um, Lords of Shadow got worse. Yeah, I can imagine that. I never played it, but um, like, cause like I said, I'm not a, um before the interview started, I'm not a huge Castlevania fan. Mm -hmm. Which ironically, because I love Metroidvania games, <laughs> but like I didn't play half of the uh, the namesake. When I was a kid, really, like I, I loaded Castlevania one up once, got really fucking confused, and then put it down. But then I was like ten. And to be and to be fair, <laughs> Nint Nintendo hard is a thing. Yeah, fucking bats, dude. <laughs> um, I'm not talking. Oh, the the bats are the least of the problems. The fucking Medusa heads are the real problem. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I mean, like to this day, I hate flying enemies in video games. Like hate them, hate them every just. To murder them dead. Uh, like, you, you probably would, you probably would have hated the birds in old school Ninja Gaiden. Yep. <laughs> Couldn't stand them. He sucked. Oh. I was like, why do you get to move in every single direction on the screen and like I can barely like get across this platform? Mm -hmm. Like the worst, especially like when flying enemies can go through platforms. I'm so like, I'm immediately thinking no, of those squ of those squids <laughs> in um. In the old, in old Mario games, who just do whatever the fuck they want. Yeah, it's just like fucking hell. Like this is the worst. <laughs> but but the I mean, in my in when I was do, when I was doing AD and D way back way back in my early days, the modules that were my that were my favorite were think were things like Alquadim and Spelljammer. Alquadim is very Arabian Nights. Um, and I would always I would always play a spell thief because the idea of the idea of ta of taking someone's taking someone's magic away from them was appealing to me. <laughs> um, and Spelljammer is basically fan is basically fantasy in space. Mm. So, uh, so of course, and yeah, it was yeah it was a broken mess because it wasn't tested properly due to certain personnel at TSR at the time, but. It's it, but it's in that so bad it's good kind of category. Yeah, I think so. Um, but the and the point, the point that I, the point that I tried to make at at that time during the whole during the during that whole um hu during that whole hubbub about um Tome of Battle is you're going to have an entire generation whose first introduction to fantasy was not. Tolkien was not Moorcock was not um, Howard. 
mm-hmm. their their intro their introduction is going to be things like slayers like or like orphan like harry potter and the stuff and and inevitably some of the people who get into fantasy through that are going to become game designers and they're going to be drawing upon that first and foremost yeah and i think like those kind of kids are going to be real disappointed with fucking D D, dude um i've seen i've seen some i've 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 seen some who I've seen some who try to put a square peg in the round a round hole with that, but and you've seen and, that um that meme the TikTok video with the um the girl on the left side of the screen and it's just like and there's a guy in the right side of the screen who's got the the thing it's like where does what hole does the square go into and she's like the square hole square hole and the guy like puts it into the square hole and she's like yes and he's like and where does the circle go that's right the square hole and she's like wait what. <laughs> And he just repeats that mm-hmm. for like each shape, and then she just gets more and more like despondent. Mm-hmm. It's like utter despair on her face, <laughs> and like this is game design. <laughs> game does game design is an act of masochism. I will not, I will not deny that. Um, yeah, but to to use a film example with that kind of approach, um, Indian Indiana Indiana Jones and Star Wars. Were were born out were born out of the the old the old adventure serials and and um and just a collection of a collection of stuff that Lucas happened to like, respectively, um, and uh, and then you ha- and then when those things hit big, you have a lot of people drawing drawing from th- drawing from that because that was their introduction. They um they didn't while Lucas may have grown up with Flash Gordon the ge- the generation after that grew up with grew up with Star Wars and used that as their influence hmm. it's it's a it's a it's one of those things that has to be thought of in a in a continuum and tr- and it's go and it's going it's going to happen one way, one way or the other um is and that that's what that's why that's why that's why tradition for its own sake is always going to be self de- is always going to be self defeating mm-hmm. and that's that's the reason why why i say we why i say we need more weeb shit because um we because not a not every first off even d and d can't figure out what kind of fantasy it wants to be and you sh- and you should and just because just because it's fantasy doesn't mean we have to be um doesn't mean we have to be britain um, yeah, seriously. I um, one one of the one of the biggest challenges that I had as a reviewer was co- was covering a was covering a fantasy RPG rooted in Tibet. Ooh, that sounds sexy. Um, there, there's been there's been that, and there's a bunch of other stuff, and I've I've made clear over the years that my favorite RPG is Legend of the Five Rings, which. As admittedly, it does get annoying when people pull the it pull the not real samurai argument with it, Dis- mm. despite the despite the fact that that was never their intention. They just they just they were just fans of Kurosawa films and used that as their inspiration. Kurosawa is amazing. Yeah. But it's it's for that reason that I that I say we need more varieties. And when it came when it came to the whole need more heroic stuff, um, mm. the the reason I the reason I say that is. There's been, I ended up saying this once with Marvel heroic role playing, but there's even though there's plenty of superhero supers games, um, when it comes to games that that mechanically reinforce being a super a superhero in one form or another, I I feel I feel like there's a like that is not a niche that's being fulfilled. Yeah. A lot of a lot of superhero a lot of superhero games are still kind of following the motif that was set forward by champions back in the eighties. Mm-hmm. That's not to say that those games are bad. It's ju- it's just that there's an angle that I don't think is being touched on. Yeah, I don't think they're bad at all. I, I like um I think you know like generally speaking, like I just don't like doing math and like uh just point by systems and stuff. It's just it's mostly math, right? And and then like you get a bunch of mechanics in there that are kind of like they don't really make you feel good, but it feels better than not having those options. <laughs> mm-hmm. And and I'm just I'm thankful that those games exist so we can build things that are different from them. Mm-hmm. 
but like at least they gave us that kind of, that first kind of push in the right direction. Yeah. And and uh, and ho- and hopefully hopefully and I'll be interested in seeing um what f- what further pushes happen as the as the years go in. Mhm. Um but with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for coming back for coming back to the temple and enjoying the um shenanigans that ha- that happen around here. Yeah, always fun. Mm-hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> sure. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and en- and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>